I was born in Calgary. I have mm-hmm. two brothers, two younger brothers. Um, mm-hmm. My parents are both social workers as well, so they both have their PhD and are both professors. I have a 10-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old stepdaughter, and an, their dad, uh, Charles, who is ex-military. Well, let's get in the lake. That'll come first one. In the lake. Yeah! She jumped up and she did it first. Get ball. Come here. Charles and I met actually in Edmonton, so I ended up moving up to Edmonton, and um, some of my colleagues took me out to a bar called the Greenhouse, which was an interesting bar. There was some guy talking to me at the bar type thing, and Charles was right next to him and said, well, if you're not going to buy her a drink, I will. <laughs> and so that's and the rest basically, is history. Yeah, that's basically, <laughs> yeah. so now, like, that was nice. Away, this lake is incredible. incredible. So I've been a social worker since 2002, and now I'm back in uh, doing my PhD. I've done all my classes and focusing on understanding what it's like to reside with a military member with PTSD. In my mind, after dealing with the stuff that I've dealt dealt with since I've retired and realizing that there is secondary trauma that I caused onto my kids and Tara, I think this couldn't have been, I think personally myself, it's three years too late. But honestly, this is a topic that needs to be addressed. I've watched so many of my friends like my friends' wives that have lost their spouses because of PTSD, and now they have to deal with it alone. So it's, it's tough, because when we come home broken, we don't just affect ourselves when we're isolating and drinking, and we affect our children and, and our spouses, so. Um, what is the military like? Well, it's, it's very different than civilian life, so they're very regimented, very structured. Um, they do kind of define who you are, essentially, and uh, teach you how to, to live. Part of the trauma is actually getting out of the military for a lot of people, and I think that's true of him as well. Like, to this day, if he could be in the military, he would. That's where I also strongly believe that it's the PTSD is probably really uh, underreported in the military because, I mean, people don't want to lose that sense of family. And Mm -hmm. so he got out in 2008 on a back injury and then he wasn't diagnosed with PTSD until 2010, but I wouldn't say that he really accepted it until maybe the last four years. For a lot of our relationship, it's like walking on eggshells, you know, like not knowing when he's going to lose his temper or when he's going to you know, see red or whatever you want to call it. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think I blamed myself a lot for when he was yelling and screaming and doing whatever he was doing instead of realizing that it was his PTSD. Sometimes people don't understand, you know, that how it's impacted me and that I'm, I'm doing better nowadays. But even like four years ago, I was... I was broken. I like I felt absolutely broken. So you know, now that I've gotten to know a bit of your story, what we're going to do next is we're going to create a digital story, which is essentially a three-minute mini movie where we're going to have some pictures and video from your own life, in addition to a story that we'll write together, um, and then we'll put some music over it, and then you'll have a chance to show that. <laughs> <laughs> Look at our dorky faces. <laughs> or even you know what would work. Um, would be them all in a parade. Oh, yeah. Here's the old ones of us, too, on his Facebook. Yeah, some old ones. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, send me those. So I think what we need to do is put in some photos of what your experience of this was like, you know? And I think that's part of the story that hasn't been told very often, you know? So what are some images that sort of show what it was like for you?
Hi. Hi, how's it going? Good, thanks. I'm Mike. I'm Jaina. Jaina, nice to meet you. Me too. Mike, I'm Tanya. Tanya, nice, nice to meet you. you. Yeah, so, so what's your role with the Canadian Mental Health Association? I was approached as a, a bereavement peer support, so okay. I did a course with them. All right, come and grab a seat, everyone. Well, thanks so much, you guys, for, for coming and being part of this. There's a, a woman that I've been working with. Her name's Tara. And uh, unfortunately, Tara wasn't able to be here tonight. There were sort of some family events that uh, made it uh, impossible for her to get here tonight. She created a digital story, um, and it's about her experience um, with PTSD. So you guys all being advocates for mental health, you all have some sort of personal connection to that. So I'm going to watch uh, Tara's digital story, and we'll have a chance just to have a little discussion afterwards. So. Here's Tara's story. Charles and I are as different as you would expect a soldier and a social worker to be, but in some important ways we are the same. When we met, Charles had already been to Bosnia, Croatia, Afghanistan and Kosovo. He had seen a lot of people die and I knew it had impacted him. So I wasn't surprised when, two years after his discharge for a back injury and countless nights of binge drinking, he went to a counselor and was diagnosed with PTSD. I thought after the diagnosis and regular visits to the counselor, things would get better, so we moved to a farmhouse in rural Saskatchewan with our four-year-old daughter. But things got worse. He would go out most nights, telling me that he would be home in half an hour, but usually he didn't come home until five or six in the morning. Being physically and socially isolated in this way, I began my own downward spiral. I was depressed, gained weight, was very anxious and sad. I felt broken, too broken to leave, and too broken to live. I began to really understand the depths of Charles's PTSD and despair because I was living in hell with him, different but the same. Seven months later, I was diagnosed with PTSD myself. I'd gone into my social work career expecting to help others, and it was hard to accept the fact that I needed help. Every day used to be hard for me, and I'm still healing, but now I have more good days than bad days, and so does Charles. Two broken people facing our PTSD together. Initial thoughts? Was there anything that stood out to you? Anything that resonated with you in her, in her story? How closely aligned her story was with her husband's story, right? Um, you know, how his story became hers. Mm -hmm. in, in, when we talk about mental illness, we'll talk about statistics, like one out of five. But I think looking at their story, um, and most of us in this room here is realizing that it's really five out of five. Right? If you're not experiencing the mental illness yourself, you are so closely connected to someone who is. And, and so that piece of it, that ability to connect with her. I kind of see the word broken as negative. It's interesting, you know, she said it over and over. And I, right. and I wondered, you know, do, do other people feel that way too? Yeah, like, I don't know. Not broken, just like different. It's just as normal as having cancer. It's an illness with the body, but yet if someone says they have cancer, you would never call them broken. Mm -hmm. I really like the, uh, I guess towards the end where there was the mutual understanding that the healing process was going to be uh, a, t a togetherness activity and that they could be each other's support. That's what I think we all try to do as a community is welcome people in to really talk openly. He was kind of the broken one for a long time and um, and then it, it did reverse in that respect so now we're both kind of healing in our, our own way I guess. 